Good afternoon, welcome everybody. I'm extremely pleased to uh, welcome Tom Cheeseman from uh, the University of Swansea where he lectures in uh, German to talk about um, some tools for comparing and analyzing translations, transviz. Um, the title he's going to talk about is Putting Translations to Work. Thank you very much, Gabby, and uh, yeah, I'm very pleased to be um, to be here, and uh, I've got to thank also Marco Grisler, who from the um, e-humanities seminar in Leipzig, who suggested I put in a proposal to, to Gabby. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of disclaimers. I'm not a classicist, obviously, um, uh, nor am I, uh, I haven't got any training in digital humanities either, really. I've been mugging up on it for the past uh, two to three years, um, as best I can. Um, I teach translation, and I'm a translator, but I don't actually have a formal background in translation studies. And um, finally, I'm going to be talking a lot about Shakespeare as an example of a much translated work, body of work. Um, but I haven't studied him since A level. So, um, so bear with me. Uh, luckily, I've got acquired immunity to imposter syndrome, so uh, I think I'll get away with it. I'm a modern linguist. I'm basically a Germanist. Um, I'm a Germanist with strong interdisciplinary leanings. Um, I wrote a doctorate on. Uh, German street ballads um, uh, in the 16th to the 20th century, looking at a long series of, of street ballads and folk ballads and how the transformations in the narratives reflect cultural and social changes over that long period. And there is a distant connection I'm not going to go into. It's not so distant, really, with, with the work um, I'm going to present here. Um, I'm Interested as a modern linguist, uh, quite urgently interested in ways of making foreign languages interesting to students, to the general public, um, particularly in the anglophone world where there's a catastrophic crisis of demand for modern languages and jobs of people like me are on the line all over the country um, and in other English speaking countries as well. While in the rest of the world, English has become practically the only language in demand. Um, over vast swathes of the world. So there's this, this, it's partly against the background of this crisis that um, I'm interested in developing these kind of tools which are designed to support research into translated texts and into process of translation and histories of translation, but which also aim to have a kind of public impact in terms of uh, providing resources for making the diversity of languages interesting and explorable for wider groups of people beyond research in education and in, in other fields as well. Um, I'm not going to be reading a paper, I'm going to be giving a presentation, slideshow and uh, a, a, a tour of a website that um, I and collaborators created in last year. Um, and the nub of what I'm doing here is it's really that I'm um, uh, on 12th of July, all being well, and I'm, some of my collaborators are going to be uh, giving a presentation to the AHRC as part of the um, application process for a four-year, £2 million project to develop Transviz on quite a large scale. Um, Transviz Translation Visualised, and the subtitle of the proposal Understanding World Cultural Heritage. Um, so this is a proposal that's under review at the moment. Um, so I'll be, I'm particularly hoping to get some feedback today from people here um, uh, as to how would you structure a 10-minute version of this presentation? Um, what kind of uh, questions do you think I should be preparing myself for? For all I know, there are some of the assessors and reviewers in this room. Um, the basic premise of Transviz is that translations of, of classic works, that's classic with a small c rather than classic cult, classic works, world heritage works, classical or modern literature, philosophy, scripture, the translations, the multiple translations of these uh, in any one language with a body of work like Shakespeare or many works of classical antiquity as well, of course. Um, there are multiple translations in any given language. And um, so the basic premise is that translations are not just a necessary evil, but that these represent a particular kind of resource, which so far has uh, hardly begun to be exploited for what it can tell us about 
the translating cultures, their histories, transcultural, intercultural dynamics, and relations, um, but also the translated works themselves. That um, the, the idea is to try and develop ways of visualizing differences among translations in such a way as they, that they shed new light on the works themselves. Um, so what I'm going to show you is some preliminary work um, prototypes of tools that we constructed in great haste uh, last year, a small team, um, which serve as kind of proof of concept for a much larger project. Um, so here, this, uh, this slide shows the, um, the, the development over the past couple of years of this project. It was initially supported by Swansea University internally with uh, my colleagues David M. Berry, who may some people in digital humanities probably know as a, a critic of digital culture. He really instigated this project by turning me on to digital humanities with an event in 2010 called the Computational Turn at Swansea, which introduced me and a lot of other people locally to um, all sorts of interesting uh, innovative work being done. Um, that turned me on to the idea of using, at that stage, I was, I was already getting interested in the history of multiple translations of a particular work in German, um, Othello. And so I had this, I had something like 40 different German translations of Othello and started thinking about how could I use, how could we develop new digital tools to explore them. Robert S. Laramie, Bob Laramie, is a uh, member of the visual computing team at Swansea University, and it turns out by chance, I had no idea until I walked across the campus for the first time and went up in the lift to the uh, computing department and discovered that they have um, a big and uh, uh, ac across the UK quite important team in visual computing. He's a specialist in data visualization and had never worked with humanities materials before but was very willing and came on board. Andrew Rothwell is a uh, professor of uh, translation. Alison Ehrman, a uh, PhD in um, uh, working with me and PhD in uh, Shakespeare uh, sonnets, the translations of the Shakespeare sonnets into German, did a lot of the donkey work at this stage. We had to photocopy and scan all these texts and uh, digitize them and so forth. Zhao Geng, a student of, um, of Bob's, um, produced some first uh, sketches for uh, visualization approaches. And Stefan Thiel was a great find. Stefan Thiel is a, I'll show some of his work in a moment. He's a Berlin based interaction designer with a small studio startup um, who'd already done, he has a background in theatre. He'd already done some quite extraordinary work with Shakespeare texts, um, producing visualizations based on algorithmic readings of them. And uh, so he's been involved ever since. And he's the main author of the. Uh, the, the front images, the visualizations, the visualization <coughs> designs. We got then uh, last year, and this is where the uh, prototype tools that I'm going to demonstrate come from. We got a grant from the AHRC under the Digital Transformations theme, um, brought on board Jonathan Hope from Strathclyde, who's a professor of literary linguistics and a specialist in uh, work, working with um, early modern English corpora, the Shakespeare plays, early modern dramas, and, and uh, early modern books online, which is a corpus of, I think, something like 25,000 books. They've, they've digitized practically the entire um, <coughs> body of books in English up to 1800 Chattel Keeley um, corpus, and he's, he's working in big projects based in the States on producing visualizations, ways of exploring that kind of a corpus. So he's a great person to have on board. And then at the bottom there, the current proposal that we have that's under review um, with an enlarged team, including uh, Lorna Hughes as another uh, digital humanities specialist based in the National Library of Wales, Pavel Dravak, who's a professor of theatre at Hull and uh, only recently appointed there, previously at Brno in Czechoslovakia, where he, sorry, the Czech Republic, where he um, uh, created and curated uh, online collections of uh, all the Czech translations of Elizabethan drama and all the Czech translations of classical drama. Um, and Jan Rybicki, who's a uh, stylometrist in Krakow, 
um, specialising in stylometry of translations, and both Pavel and Jan are also practising translators. Um, in Pavel's case, he's a librettist, uh, and Jan has translated many of the... Uh, well, he's translated something like, like 50 um, contemporary American and, and British novels. We've managed to convince Shakespeare's Globe Theatre that this is a project worth investing in as partners. Um, Wolfston Translation are going to be managing um, digitisation of texts, or rather transcription of texts for us. Studio NAND obviously is involved, National Library of Wales Abbey, the um, OCR company. And we have a network, a team, a worldwide team of international Shakespeare translation consultants who are going to be supplying us with translations of texts. We're focusing on Hamlet and the Merchant of Venice. Hamlet, obviously the world's most famous play. Um, the Merchant of Venice is of great interest for its translations in lots of different countries, but it's of particular interest to us because it's studied by 14 to 15 year olds in China. So that means every year, 22 million students read the trial scene in The Merchant of Venice, and I don't know which edition of The Merchant of Venice they use, but I like the idea that we could give them access to alternative translations in Chinese, and we could give them access to alternative editions in English, and we could give them access to alternative translations in Polish or whatever, with tools that enable them to appreciate what the different translators have done to these different translations, even if they can't read Polish or English? Can we provide ways of, of uh, sensitising them to questions of translation and adaptation and, and so on? Um, so at the top there, one of our main digital outputs, this is something that the um, Shakespeare Globe Theatre is particularly keen on, is a, something that will become a kind of interface, a kind of front page for our project, would be a time map so you can see how has Shakespeare spread around the world. So lots of metadata. Um, and we've got a prototype, which I've got time, I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. In 2016 is the 400th birthday. And we we're expecting lots of um, uh, publicity opportunities and interest in Shakespeare. Um, following on from 2012, the big Shakespeare um, sure everybody noticed, a uh, major part of the Olympics was a big Shakespeare celebration, 37 plays in 37 languages at the Globe, and so on. Um, okay, so the time map is a kind of uh, metadata-based uh, overview of Shakespeare around the world. Then we have this library of aligned translations, Focusing our efforts mainly on Shakespeare, but uh, as kind of side projects um, of a smaller corpora um, by uh, at least three of the co-investigators. And the idea is that this library, of course, is infinitely extensible. So for, we, can, we can start, anybody who wants to work with us, if they're interested in doing so, can co collect and and, uh, and align, and then tools for curating and exploring and analysing these kind of aligned translation corpora. And finally, research-based multimedia demonstrations of tools for worldwide students of a range of different subjects that this can be relevant to. People in China studying Shakespeare, people studying translation or adaptation. Transcreation, that term uh, may not be entirely familiar, is used increasingly in the translation industry uh, nowadays as a result of machine translation and crowdsourcing the bottom has dropped out of the translation market it's another tale of woe um, after the crisis in uh, for, for modern linguists um, but the professional translators bread and butter translation jobs are now being done by machines or they're being distributed through mechanical turk and those kind of um, systems to um, all sorts of other places and so in order to in order to maintain some kind of a profitable translation industry the industry has to focus on what they're calling transcreation which is where you're not trying to just mechanically translate 
something from language A into language B, but you're using uh, a, a nuanced knowledge of both the source culture and the target culture in order to produce something which is not a straightforward translation, but which depends on human understanding. Um, something which machines will never be able to do, I think we can say with some confidence, um, or at least not do well enough to be paid to do it. Um, so, and those other subject languages, linguistics and comparative cultural studies, and not least, uh, digital humanities, a platform such as we envisage, um, would provide one way for offering uh, opportunities to learn how to, uh, how to uh, not just use certain kinds of tools, but say take modules and develop new tools on the basis of them. This image is, uh, or an extract from this image, is on your, it's on the uh, publicity for the session. And what this shows is 5 times 735 versions of Othello in German. Othello, Act 1, Scene 3. We were in a hurry, we didn't have uh, that much, many resources, and so we actually transcribed and proofread and so forth, just one scene from the play, about 10% of it. And in each of these little images, the, I'll show you the next slide, it's clearer, the left-hand uh, column is Act 1, Scene 3, all the speeches in Act 1, Scene 3, each little bar, each horizontal bar represents a speech, and the thickness of the speech represents how long it is, how many, uh, based on the word count, how many words there are. And the right-hand column is, in this case, the first translation of Othello, the first translator, Christoph Martin Wieland, of, of all Shakespeare's works, uh, plays, anyway, into German. Um, in 1766, and you can see immediately if you compare Wieland with others, you can see how Wieland's translation is, despite the fact that he has, um, let's see if I go back a little bit, if he, I can show, can I get the map? Yeah, here we are. You can see how he's omitted a couple of speeches here, and one there, um, but overall his, his version is quite a lot longer than, say, Gundolf's from 1909. Zymoglu has uh, left quite a lot out, but on the other hand, this red bar is Othello's great speech to the Senate. Um, if you know Othello, this is the bit where he tells the Duke the, uh, and the assembled people the story of how he met Desdemona and fell in love with her and so on. There's a great long speech there, about 300 words. So Zymoglu's version overall is shorter, but he's expanded that particular speech. Um, Simar, a recent adaptation for children, actually, um, splits Othello's speech up into a number of different mini-speeches were actually assigned to different characters. Felsenstein Stuber Boito, does anybody know who this is? Boito was the librettist of Verdi's Othello, and Felsenstein and Stuber are the translators of the Italian libretto, which is based on the English play, uh, and also, I think um, uh, Boito also referred to French translations. So, um, back in, well, not into German, on into German. So it goes from English, partly by French, to Italian and into German. And Boito uh, moves the material around quite, quite freely. Now, this is one scene from Othello, but it clearly it is a demonstration of the, of the potential for using this kind of approach to give everybody a, a snapshot of, of how different translators and adapters have, have restructured a work. Um, happens to be Othello, it happens to be Shakespeare, it needn't only be. It's based, of course, on a lot of work on, um, I'll show you in a minute, uh, roughly how that works, of, of, of transcribing all these texts, proofreading and correcting them, and, and then segmenting and aligning in this case, speech by speech. So that's what I'll do now. I'll give you a little bit of a tour. I'm going to show you, um, first of all, a very primitive uh, website that I created in the run-up to this uh, project, uh, where I crowdsource from all the way around the world translations of one 14-word couplet from Othello. And I'll show you um, the, uh, the, the 
our, our proof of concept time map, and I'll show you the um, tool prototypes that we've developed. And you might want to know if you want to play with these. There are two installations. Closed, VVV closed, is uh, <coughs> you can't edit it unless you have specific permission. VVV, you can you can go in there and you can do what you like. So um, people do go in there and they trash it. Um, you're welcome to do that. Inspirations at the bottom. Um, if I've got time, I'll show you those. Um, this is one of them, but let me go straight into the, the map. Okay, so this map is designed by uh, Studio Nan, by, by Stefan Thiel, and it's, it's just a proof of concept, as I say. And you can, is it going to work? Yes. Okay, we can move back and forwards. There's, um, so it's a map, of, uh, a map of Europe. Most of the translations of Othello in German are uh, from Europe. Um, one or two from London, um, from 1952 and from 1972. Um, the lines are collect connecting the place where the translation was done and the place where it was published. The Shakespeare's Globe Theatre is just as interested, in fact more interested really, in performances than, than in productions than, than translations. So what we want to do is produce is eventually a map that, that does both. There's a uh, there's a timeline here where and this is a, I have a disagreement with the with the um, with the designer about this. As you move forward between 1766 and 2010, they grey out. I think they should. I think they should start off grey and become black as they or, you know more present. As they so you can in, in principle you can see. They appear to be disappearing, don't they? Whereas actually you want them to be appearing. Would, would that happen if you put the, the right hand slider to the, to the left? So you move that to the right, they start to appear. Yeah. yeah. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and if you click on one, any one of them, it calls up information about them. So we've got some, quite a lot of metadata um, and free text. Uh, is it showing all the metadata? It's actually, it's not. It's but anyway, so it's a demonstration of a principle um, that is, again, applicable to, to anything at all, really. The, the, the problem is, there are lots of problems. But with, with William Shakespeare metadata, there's just so much of it. There is an incredibly huge amounts of it, and it's a real design problem how to get that onto a map even of the world. Okay, I'm going to show you very briefly a website that I created kind of independently of the funded project when I got interested in um, this couplet as a way of, initially for me, for exploring the differences between uh, historical, different historical German translations of Othello. Um, so I invited people around the world to contribute their own translations, and uh, in many cases, so for example with, with uh, Hungary, not much of a response, but, um, but still, um, Persian, um, I think you'll be impressed, who knew that there are one, two, three, four different translations of Othello in Persian um, in quite recent editions. These are all in fact, available in bookshops in, in Tehran. Um, so there's not one translation, there's not one Farsi translation. Um, and this is something to be emphasized over and over again, the, um, the diversity of them. And uh, these contributors provided uh, very interesting comments and their own retranslations, uh, trying to improve on those that are already available, and a little mini essay about it. Um, through this exercise, I got in touch with the people around the world who are interested in contributing to the project that, that, we've, that we've started. Um, so where, uh, where in, in the application, the proposal that's gone to AHRC, we have, we have eight or nine, eight, I think, um, uh, international contributing participants who are going to be collecting between, uh, between 
10 and 30 versions of each of the two plays, Hamlet and the Merchant of Venice, and the languages are, let me try and remind myself, I wrote them down, you'd probably be interested, Arabic, Chinese, Czech, French, German, I'm going to do French and German, Arabic, Chinese, Czech, French and German, Hungarian, Korean, Persian, Polish, Slovak, Spanish, and finally English. Um, there are multiple versions of Shakespeare in English as well. Um, so to show you now, this is the project that the AHRC uh, funded, the Proof of Concept project. We've got an array of, um, I think it's, I thought it was going to say 37, 38 versions of Act 1, Scene 3 of Othello from 1766 to 2010. And I'm going to very briefly show you how the alignment process works. Let's log me out a little bit today. Um, on the left, we have... Now, this, this is not going to work because of the, the view setup. Maybe you could help me. Gabby, have you any idea? How to, because uh, the, the, this box here, we need to be able to read what's in this box. Can the box be resized? Oh, that's what I'm wondering. On every blooming computer you do it, it, it looks different, doesn't it? Has anybody got any suggestions of how to resize it? I mean, it's not, it's not good, is it? These lines are alignments. And so it's, it's a kind of semi-automatic alignment process. Um, if you align... These blue lines are alignments that are already encoded in there. Um, I, can, I can take them out. I won't do it because I like ruin things. Um, yes, I can do it. This is VVV. I'll take them out. Um, and then I'll try and show you. So I select. Select a speech there. And I select a speech there. And I choose... Um, which is the uh, which is the alignment that is in now? Create a segment between no. Create a segment around align. Oh, sorry, I choose align. I haven't done this for months. It's all had to be done, right? And <coughs> and then when I click auto, it goes through and it aligns. If you can't see it because of display, but it goes through and it clicks and it, and it aligns every speech, and then I have to go through it again, and if there's a speech that this translator, uh, VLANs, has missed out, uh, then I have to correct that manually and run the auto thing again, and so on. Um, so, sorry, the, um, the, the display is not good. As I say, this is a, um, it's a prototype. Um, the way it was set up on my computer, it became, it became possible for me to align um, versions of this scene in as little as 10 minutes. With, with corrections and so on. And I can take any segment in there and I can define the segment, uh, any bit of the text, I can define that as a segment. I can attach any attributes that I like to that and then I can uh, find the corresponding element uh, and define that as a segment and, and align those. So it's, there's, there's a semi-automated alignment of speeches as predefined as segments and then there's um, completely manual free alignment of, of um, any other kinds of segments, which I've only used for um, phrases in, in a work, but could also be used to tag something as humor or irony or um, uh, metaphor or a rhetorical device. Or Okay, <clears throat> this is the parallel view, which is based, as you can see from these columns, on the um, alignment maps that I showed you at the beginning. But uh, the, uh, the, the speech prefixes are encoded with, with the speeches, so if I want to see all the speeches by uh, Desdemona, for example, then it ought to... Yeah, there they are. Right, they're highlighted in blue, and I can actually, um, oops, I can 
reorder them so that all her speeches are clumped together. <coughs> and I click on any of those speeches and it highlights that one. And it should. It's not going to play, is it? Okay. The crucial thing here, which it's not working, let's see if it works in the other one. Um, <coughs> Back to Corpus. Bear with me, it's a good job we've got two installations because they don't always, either of them don't necessarily do what they're supposed to do. So, a parallel view, take a speech at random, and there we are. It automatically aligns the corresponding speech in the translation because it has been aligned. And so, this is a way of, of, uh, of easily and conveniently navigating around the uh, parallel texts, which I think is quite nice when it works, um, but not particularly radical, I think it has to be said. More radical is this view here, which is called Eddie and Viv, and if I've got time, um, I will uh, go into more detail trying to explain um, the, what it's based on. So on the left-hand side of the view is the English text with different segments highlighted in different colours, and I'll be explaining in just a moment what they mean. If I click on any segment, and I'm choosing here is the man this more because it's a relatively simple bit of English with, you would expect, relatively predictable kind of translation into German. Over here on the right pops up, and I can, uh, I can order these different translations of that segment in, in various different ways. I'm ordering them here by what we call eddy value, which is a numerical value, and uh, in this display we actually give the number, which is a ludicrously um, uh, precise numerical figure, but it's based on, it's based on a calculation of the difference between each translation and all the others. And so all the translations which are most alike to any of the other translations are at the top of this display, and as we read down, and the yellow lines are a graphical representation of the increasing numerical values, as we read down, and you can read it in English if you don't know German because Google is supplying us with a automatic back translation here. So as you read down, here is the man the more, here is the man this more, this more, the, here steht der man, the, trans the Google translation is identical but the, actual, the German is actually different, it, it means here stands the man. And they increase in unpredictability or in distinctiveness or in originality as we go down the sequence until you get to, in this case, Motschach from 1990, a rather daring translation. Not a bad translation, actually. An interpretation which is in many ways justifiable. So that's a... <coughs> the idea there is that multiple translations can be ordered, can be sorted, uh, can be grouped together, and can be distinguished in terms of... And the, the maths of this, I've, I'm, if we've got time, I'll show you. I kind of invented this idea and, um, and, and invented with my O-level maths, um, invented a way of using, creating concordances. We take all these segments, the translation, put them in concordance, and then we can assign um, uh, word frequency values to each word, and the translation that uses words that are frequent across the whole corpus gets a low value, and the translation that uses words that are infrequent in that corpus gets a high value. There are lots of different ways of calculating this, obviously. Uh, the important thing to remember, I think, is that, is that we're not measuring an absolute quality of the translation at all. We're measuring relationships between translations. And then for each segment, we have these multiple translations, and we have a range and a distribution of what we're calling eddy values. And so every segment, every speech or every part of a speech, 
has a different than what we call a viv value, which is a, which is a, which is derived from the range and the distribution of the the eddy values, and that gives us a way of surveying the the English text, as it is in this case, the original text, and being able to identify which are the segments of that text, which are the bits of that text, the parts of that text, which translators generally agree on, generally treat in the same sort of way, and which are the ones that they, where they depart from one another, where there is um, contention or, or difference. Um, and the display as we have it at the moment, there's not a vast amount of difference across the whole thing. We can change the floor and the ceiling of the display and we can, we can use a number of different ways of actually calculating VIV from the eddy values. Um, the highest single VIV value that we have is, is from um, these words, what ho, what ho, what ho, because every translator, pretty much every translator has a different way of rendering those. Um, which is, in a way, quite interesting from the point of view of translation studies. But what I was hoping for was, 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 was more along the lines of you know, where are the interpretative problems in this scene? And um, I think with, with more work on this kind of approach, we will be able to get to something like that. What is the hardest line in Hamlet? We will be able to pin that down in terms of the international reception of Hamlet. Under project, we have uh, quite a lot of documentation about the project and what we're trying to do and why and so forth, and under Eddie and Viv. I want to show you very briefly a completely different approach to this kind of a work, which was created by um, uh, uh, Xiao Geng and Bob Laramie. This is not online, it's a, uh, it's a prototype which is um, which is offline, and there's a video here about it, which I'll show a little bit of. They worked with just a sample of our sample. Um, in fact, how can I pause it? Pause, pause. Um, they, <coughs> at the bottom here, they've got, it says segment one. They've got, I think they worked with seven speeches of roughly equal length in one, two, three, four, five, ten different versions. And um, so can I, how can I scale this up, do you think? Can I make this go big? The little icon just to the left of the word video, I think. Oh, no, yes, that's the one. So the top left of the screen that you're looking at um, shows a uh, parallel coordinates view of the uh, relative distance uh, between e e all of these translations compared to one another. The, this line across the middle was uh, turned out for me to be the most useful. It uses a, a, um, a two-dimensional space and the proximity of the dots to one another is the proximity of the translations um, relative to one another. And the, uh, up here on the top right are heat maps um, which show precisely which words are being used in each of the translations. And this is completely experimental, but it, it's, it, uh, I was able to use it to, to discover some interesting things that I really, I really didn't know. In the middle here are these two versions, Erich Fried from 1970 and, and Lauterbach from 1973. Um, Lauterbach, who nobody has read since, the, uh, since 1973, there was a performance in East Germany, um, a, a, it's a theatre script that's completely obscure. Um, turns out to be uh, quite close, very close to Erich Fried, a famous translator of the, of the 1970s. Um, and so one of the things that we're finding out here is, is kind of instances of, of plagiarism, perhaps. Um, we can certainly use this kind of approach to reconstruct genealogies of trans translations, um, or this and a number of other approaches. But what was almost more interesting for me was the, um, the discovery that, well, I'd, expect, I'd expected these, um, there are several speeches by Desdemona here, and there are several speeches by Othello, and what Desdemona has to say in this scene is very contentious, and I expect the translators to vary a lot in their interpretations of it. Othello's speeches are 
less so. But it turns out that the distances between the translators when it comes to Othello are more regular, they're larger, generally as if the translators are trying to distinguish themselves from one another more when they're translating Othello than when they're translating any of the other characters. And that kind of makes sense, but it's very interesting to see it you know, kind of, well, I hesitate to say proved, proven by, by this little experiment, but um, it's indicated to me that there's, that, you know, we're on to something, quite possibly. Let me, let me finish with Derrida, shall I? Um, the uh, Spectres of Marx, if you know it, his, his book on Marx, which is all organised around Hamlet, um, and in particular this phrase, the time is out of joint. And uh, in the first chapter, he, he talks about the problems of translating that phrase into French. Um, and he says, I'll read this out, the translations themselves must find themselves out of joint however correct and legitimate they may be, and whatever right one may acknowledge them to have, they are all disadjusted, because unjust in the gap that affects them. Within them, for sure, as their meaning remains necessarily equivocal, then in their relation to one another and thus in their multiplicity, and finally, or first of all, in their irreducible inadequacy to the other language and to the stroke of genius of the event that makes the law to all the virtualities of the original. The excellence of the translation cannot help. Worse, and this is the whole drama, it can only aggravate or seal the inaccessibility of the other language. So this is a kind of tragic view of translation. It's a very commonplace view of translation, actually, and you know, it's kind of disappointing to see uh, Derrida taking this, this position, I think, really. Um, the, there's this three kinds of gaps that he talks about. The first is this that all language is, is equivocal, that there is, uh, there is no text that is not multiply interpretable. And the, f the third is the fact that, uh, as, we, as we all know, when, when we go on holiday somewhere, we don't speak a language. Yeah, there's a gap between languages. But the really interesting thing, and that is where this project of ours is located, which he kind of passes over, is the relation to one another and the multiplicity of the, the actual translations and, of course, the, the possible translations. Um, Anthony Pym talks about the difference between active and uh, translation, major translation theorists, the difference between active and passive translations, where um, passive translations are kind of uninteresting because they just, uh, just update the text for a new context. Active retranslations are, are much more interesting. What we've found, what I've found certainly in the work on Shakespeare translations, is that that's a distinction which is impossible to uphold. All retranslations are active. Um, but again, it begs the question of can we use retranslations, their multiplicity, the gaps between them, to read translated works in new ways, to offer new ways of. Uh, for, for monoglot Shakespeare readers to, to read Shakespeare in new ways. Um, and this, this brings me to the, what you have in your handout, the paper handout, and I put this on, on paper because I, I was not sure whether it would display clearly enough. There's an awful lot of writing on it, but um, this is from a, a fairly recent doctorate from the Netherlands about, um, he's writing about 70 retranslations of Shakespeare's Hamlet into Dutch, and he's not including published translations. So this is, this is just theatre script translations. Um, and there's a kind of useful grid there for the, um, oh, I, missed, I missed the title of the figure out, didn't I, on the, on the handout. It's possible options of a theatre translator. So these are, these are four, this is a way of visualising the, the kind of space of choice that you inhabit as a theatre translator. I just bring that to your attention. And then perhaps we should turn the page on the handout and it's, it's kind of going back to where I started on this project with that cu this couplet from Othello where, and I don't, I don't think I've got time to go in for it now and it's probably not really necessary and appropriate there, but do take it away. The, um, at the foot of the page is a translation by a uh, um, very significant contemporary German writer of Turkish background um, who, on whom I've done quite a lot of work 
whose version of Othello from 2003 is very highly controversial, very, very successful. It's toured all around the world and uh, it's been to Stratford and uh, as well as Seoul and, and Moscow and so on. Um, and, and he's just one in the series of, of German translators who, who with, with this couplet, have expressed differentiated views about uh, not just race, but state power and gender and class. In his case, he's the only translator to, to, um, uh, to translate for more fair than black as more noble than black. For him, it's a, race is a class issue. Um, I would have a lot to say about that. I've written a lot about this couplet. I'm just skipping through these slides quickly. I want to come to the couple of slides which compare, uh, and again, this is manual work, this is kind of pre-digital, but this is the kind of thing that I would like it to be possible to do with a transvis inter interface much more easily than when I did this, counting things by hand and sorting things out and so forth. Um, I'm comparing 22 French translations of this couplet and 32 German ones, and just the choices that translators make for black and for fair. And you can see how this starts to move towards a, 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 you know, the possibility of, of, of cultural comparison and the different uh, ways that these uh, different cultures compare, uh, different, that translate. So the Germans I've highlighted in red where there are st what seem to me statistically significant differences. Many German translators omit black. They don't translate black at all. They have, they have no word that corresponds to black. Um, and they use alternatives like ugly, dark or ugly. Um, on the other hand, below for fair, in French it's very rare to, trans to understand fair as meaning black, as meaning white. But it's very common in German. But it gets even more interesting when we divide the translators up into famous ones and obscure ones. And this, this is a bit iffy, perhaps, um, but it, it is possible to say this, these, these translators, they're, they're in encyclopedias, they're in, um, they're in Wikipedia and, and, and so forth, and others. Um, there are very, very large numbers in both languages of translators who are um, working for theatres as producers and directors or, or whatever, journalists, hacks who've done translations. And we can see an extraordinary difference there in that in French there is no difference. Whereas in German there is a vast difference. It's the obscure translators who use black and uh, for, uh, <coughs> for black rather than anything else. And it's the um, obscure translators who use uh, schön, beautiful. For, for fair. Um, and I have a theory about why this is, because there's a different political significance of Shakespeare translation in the two uh, cultures, and um, the German famous translators are much, much more concerned to differentiate themselves from one another and from the pack of ordinary translators. Um, I've written about that. And and I've got a number of slides, but I think I'll stop there. I've got a number of slides which kind of go back through the history of how I, uh, my, my initial efforts to define these Eddie and Viv algorithms. But I think I've shown you enough for you to get an idea about what we're about. Um, just to stress that what I've shown, again, is some prototypes. It's a proof of concept idea, and that we want to work with as many different people as possible on developing new tools and ways of exploiting the kind of corpora that's, that we want to create. And um, hopefully there'll be interest here in doing that. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, yes, that was, um, that was a fascinating and whirlwind um, <laughs> tour through what you, you clearly could have carried on talking about for another two hours. Easily. Um, um, without boring us for, for a moment, I'm sure. Um, and um, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot in there. I'm wondering a little bit about a couple of technical things, but I might ask about that um, yeah. a bit later. The first, um, the first thing that just occurred to me um, was on your the, your last point about these obscure translators yeah. um, being much less varied than the um, than the more famous ones. 
Um, is that, is one interpretation of that just that the obscure ones are less good? And so they translate black as schmucks because that's the obvious thing to do, whereas the, the more famous ones are being, are being a bit more poetic. I mean, they're, they're more creative translators. Yeah. It's that, just the that, obvious. That, that, that might be. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is why there isn't the same difference in French. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's because right. that's, that, mm. that, that is what yeah. you would expect. That that's, was, if it's that yeah. kind of yeah. 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 reason or cause, then, then why, yeah. doesn't it, why doesn't it apply equally? Yeah. That's the, that's the interesting difference, isn't it? Not, not so much between the famous and the obscure as the difference between the French and the German. You know? But that, that difference only becomes apparent yeah. when you divide yeah. them into the famous and the obscure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I put this together in, uh, a couple of years ago for there was a conference at Swansea called The Author Translator. Mm. And, um, and I, I was kind of querying what, what is meant by that concept. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it was clear to the it was it's, it's a perfectly clear concept. It's somebody who is yeah. famous as a writer, mm -hmm. and who is also a translator. Right. Um, and so I, I kind of playfully thought, well, you know, is there really a difference between mm -hmm. people who are famous writers and translators and people mm -hmm. who are just translators? Yeah. And there is in German, but not in French. On this, I mean, this is a small sample, after all. It's only two yeah. words. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. I don't know how far we can generalise from that, I don't know. But that's what transviz is. Four. That's why it's interesting to create a very large and extensible yeah. library of translations and start to yeah. investigate such questions. Mr. Sindwat, have you um, thought of like cross referring this with kind of very simple sort of external statistics like numbers of copies sold over the years? Do you think that's simple? Uh, well, <laughs> conceptually simple, but probably very. Um, I mean, it, it, is there some way of measuring? The popularity of particular translations, maybe that's a fair way. Uh, the numbers of editions is, right. uh, is, is, is possible. So the, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's um, on, on your handout, number three, uh, some of you may have heard of the Schlegel Tiek edition, uh, the German um, canonical Shakespeare edition from the 1830s, which is still... If you study Shakespeare in German schools, you read Schlegel Tiek. Um, they have their name on the top of two major German romantic poets. Um, and, but about half of the plays were actually translated by this guy called Baudissin. But <coughs> that translation is <coughs> probably several thousand times more popular than any other in terms of numbers of editions and the size of those editions and the, the likelihood that if you, you know, encounter a random Shakespeare translation in German, that is the one you're going to get. Um, and it's still the most often played on German stages, um, except where a new one is commissioned, usually. So, um, and <coughs> one of the effects that we're actually looking at here is that, that transla their translation of the couplet, or so his translation of the couplet, this couplet, is so bold, so non-literal, Translating black as ugly in a, in a very kind of legitimate way in its own terms, but it's so bold that <coughs> that challenges subsequent translators. So there's, there is, and this is something which needs a, lo a lot more work, but it's because you know, there is an effect of um, translators differentiate, need to differentiate themselves from one another, and the, the stronger the translation that you're faced with, the, your precursor. The, the bigger the challenge to, and that, that works again not, not just globally, but segment by segment, speech by speech, line by line, word by word.